We will now hear from Sarah Parvanta on ALS Focus, a new survey program informed by people with ALS and caregivers. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, I'm Sarah Parvanta, and I direct the ALS Focus survey program at the ALS Association. On behalf of my co-authors, the association, and our ALS Focus partners, it's wonderful to be able to share information with you on ALS Focus. I'll present findings from the first focus survey on insurance needs and financial burdens, and I'll talk about other new surveys coming out of this program. ALS Focus is a patient and caregiver-led program that surveys people with ALS and caregivers to understand their experiences, needs, and preferences as they face this disease. Importantly, a patient and caregiver advisory committee informs every aspect of ALS Focus, from survey questions to participant recruitment methods. And photos on this slide show many of our committee members. We also work with academic and federal government experts, along with pharmaceutical industry experts who sponsor, sponsor the FOCUS program. In the ALS field, scientifically rigorous efforts to collect experience and preference data and share these data with other researchers for free are all new frontiers. ALS FOCUS is designed to address these gaps and in doing so, inform patient-focused drug development, ALS policy, and ALS care. Essentially, ALS FOCUS surveys um, ALS Focus uses surveys as a powerful tool to tackle challenges related to drug development, clinical care, insurance coverage, caregiver burden, and more. Data from Focus surveys directly reflect the needs of large numbers of people with ALS and caregivers, and their experiences and preferences really are most important to understand when designing clinical trials and creating policies and programs that are aiming to improve their lives. A couple of unique features are built into ALS Focus to enhance its impact. First, Focus surveys take place online so participants can take part in this research from the comfort of their own homes. Our partners at Massachusetts General Hospital developed this online platform. The platform assigns a neuro stamp to each Focus participant, which is a derivative of a global unique identifier. Our partners at MGH developed this NeuroStamp and it serves to both de-identify study participants and it allows focus data to be linked to other studies that use NeuroStamps. So for example, it's possible to combine quality of life data from focus with clinical outcome data from clinical trials. Connecting different data sources like these can broaden the impact of ALS research overall. De-identified focus data are free for the public and ALS researchers to use after an embargo period, and we definitely encourage additional analysis using these focus data. The data that we share includes uh, regional indicators, demographics, and disease history to allow for more nuanced analysis on whether ALS needs and experiences differ in different parts of the U.S. or by people's backgrounds or disease progression. So now that you have a sense for the aims and the design of the ALS Focus program, I'll present results from the first ALS Focus survey, which measured insurance needs and financial burdens that people with ALS and caregivers experience. We conducted this first survey last spring. People with ALS, current caregivers, and past caregivers who are at least 18 years old and live in the United States are able to participate in ALS Focus, and so these individuals were eligible for this first survey. We recruit participants through social media, ALS Association chapters, national emails, and other channels, and in total this first survey had 440 participants. Uh, questions in this first survey asked about insurance types and costs, medical needs and costs, and burdens and stress stemming from ALS expenses and from insurance needs. Here's what we found. This first table shows that 63% of participants reporting reported using Medicare fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage to cover ALS treatment. Increasing this percentage is warranted due to the relatively lower cost of these Medicare programs. This type of result suggests we should provide guidance on insurance options early into diagnosis 
to help people living with ALS access as many forms of insurance and as many combinations of insurance as possible to ensure the best coverage. Participants also answered questions about their ALS medical expenses. The data showed that wheelchair accessible vehicles and home modifications were among the most highly needed, costly, and burdensome one-time expenses that people with ALS faced. Notably, recurring costs for prescription, prescription drugs uh, were relatively low, but we also are thinking about this data in future contexts. As new ALS treatments come to market, high costs for some of those treatments might follow, depending on the type of drug. And unless coverage options are in place to pay for those treatments, people with ALS will kind of bear the brunt of those added costs. It's imperative that people with ALS understand their options for coverage and that they have the ability to pay for these new treatments. Finally, participants with ALS in this survey reported how stressed they felt when dealing with ALS-related finances. Their stress was especially high when understanding their insurance coverage, covering the costs for medical treatments and services, and managing med medical billing paperwork. Now, the focus demographic survey that, that, we involve, that we offer showed that income levels in this first survey sample were relatively high, with nearly 40% of participants having incomes of $75,000 a year or more. Um, in turn, the stress scores we see here could underestimate the financial stress um, in the full ALS population, the types of financial and the level of financial stress that, that people experience, particularly those who have lower incomes. Of course, some ALS costs are fixed regardless of income level, such as home modifications and wheelchair accessible vehicles, which we saw earlier. However, covering those fixed costs likely imposes differential burden and stress depending on someone's income level. Finally, income can impact the type of insurance that people with ALS access. So income is a really important variable that we measure in this ALS focused program, and we're continually looking for ways to increase representativeness in, in focus participation to ensure everyone's needs are heard and can be addressed. Regardless, um, the data from this first ALS focus survey attached real numbers to the high costs and financial stressors around this disease. More work is necessary to make equipment, services, and insurance more affordable and less burdensome to people with ALS and their families. We show other results from this survey on the ALS focus webpage shown here on this slide. Uh, for instance, results showed a quarter of participants with ALS and caregivers said they had to borrow money or go into debt because of their ALS treatment or needing to provide care. So their results like this, um, and there are many other interesting measures in this first survey, and there's a lot of useful ways to analyze these data. And again, we make these data available for free to encourage more analysis. We're currently wrapping up the second focus survey on what matters most to people with ALS. Over 680 people have participated in this survey, both people with ALS and caregivers. So this survey uses the ALS Health Index short form developed by Dr. Chad Heatwell and his team at the University of Rochester. Questions ask about ALS symptoms and what kind of impact those symptoms have on people's daily lives. This type of data is relevant for developing benchmarks of success in ALS clinical trials and creating drugs and treatments that benefit people with ALS in ways that matter to them. Our next survey will focus on caregivers and ask what burdens they face as they care for their loved ones with ALS and what sorts of programs and trainings would help them most in their caregiving roles. Caregivers, of course, play a critical role in the fight against ALS, and so we aim for this survey to bring their needs and their preferences to the forefront. We're also planning for a risk tolerance survey to inform a framework for weighing the benefits and risks of different ALS therapies. Currently, ALS Focus has 
almost 1,500 members, and it's growing. Surveys on new topics launch several times a year, so the community can continue to participate on an ongoing basis. We invite people with ALS, current caregivers, and past caregivers to read more about ALS Focus on our webpage, and the URL for that is shown here, and then sign up to participate at alsfocus.org. To close, we want to thank ALS Focus participants for being part of this program, and we thank our Focus Steering Committee, our partners at MGH, our pharmaceutical industry sponsors, including Biogen, Genentech, Cytokinetics, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, and Ionis Pharmaceuticals for their support and their valuable contributions to this work. We especially thank our Patient and Caregiver Advisory Committee who have committed who have significantly contributed to every step since focus began. For any questions, please feel welcome to contact me at the email address listed here on this slide, and I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that great presentation. We are doing okay on, on time, so I think we have enough time for one question. Uh, let me see. Well, I have a, I have a question actually. Uh, Sarah, do you have any recommendation for anyone willing to apply the same model in their countries? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you everyone and, and good morning. Um, I think that the, one of the advantages of ALS focus is this online aspect to it um, because it invites more participation than perhaps trying to conduct these surveys in person. So um, when implementing something like this in other countries, uh, the same online advantages apply. And um, one thing that we have found, however, and we're looking for solutions, and I imagine this could apply in other contexts in other countries, is um, being sure to reach people who might not have access to online surveys or online internet connections. And um, that's a challenge in many different fields. Um, so in that case, we wouldn't end up hearing from those, those particular individuals. And so um, finding a way to, to marry the advantages of uh, internet-based surveys with um, the complexities of people's access to the internet is really important to this kind of survey program. So that's something I would think about uh, looking out for. And if internet access is um, really difficult to come by in a certain context, this might not work as well. On the other hand, if uh, it seems that many people in the population are connected, then this could be a really useful tool. Okay, I have uh, two more questions. I will read them both together. Uh, one of them is, when will this data be available? And the other one is, is this the first time you, you do the survey? Yes, uh, great questions. The data will be available very soon. We're, um, we're just getting it all ready for posting publicly, and of course that involves a process of ensuring none of the data are identifiable, that no one using these data could link someone's name or personal information to the actual responses that they gave. That's really important to us. So um, we'll have those ready just within the next couple of weeks or so, um, and those will be posted on our ALS Focus um, uh, a link to those will be posted on our ALS Focus website. The, the data themselves will be housed in the uh, Harvard Dataverse through our partners at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, but we'll have information on how to access those data from our Focus website. I just put the link uh, into the chat. And the other question was, um, uh, is this the first survey that we've conducted? Yes, it was. Uh, the, the results that I presented today were from the first ALS focus survey. So each survey will have a different topic depending on uh, what seems to be the most important issues uh, that the community is facing. Um, and 
as I mentioned, we have a patient and caregiver advisory committee, and I see some of those folks on this call, so thanks for being here. Um, and, and they definitely uh, let us know what seems to be the important next issue to develop measures around and then to um, present those surveys to our ALS focus panel so people are allowed to sign up on an ongoing basis. And then these surveys come out on a rolling basis several times a year. Great, Sarah, thank you for typing the link to, the, to this survey. It's on the chat box for everyone. And thank you for your impressive presentation. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you.